Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. We'll get started here in about 60 to 90 seconds. Uh, we have record registration. Um, really happy to have everybody here. Where's everybody coming in from? This is where we light up chat. Baltimore. Hey, we, we've got some Baltimore roots on the call too. Arlington, DA. See uh, Long Island, Portland. Okay. I'm in Long Beach right now. Uh, kangaroo time is in uh, Buffalo. Andrew, where are you at right now? Are you said you're in Virginia? North Washington, D.C. You're in D.C.? Okay. Seattle, Illinois. Um, Philly? Nashville, all right. See some Hoosiers out there. All right, we'll give it about 30 more seconds and then I'll get started with a few announcements. Hey everybody, um, we will get started. I'm very glad to have you all here. Again, um, humble. I'll just kind of start out with, with, some, with, with the premise for what we're doing. Um, almost a month ago uh, at Kangaroo Time, uh, we decided as a software provider, as a company, we would stop our pursuit of new customers. Um, we, would, we would stop, you know, the, as a startup, the pursuit is always about growth. Um, and it just seemed like it wasn't time for that anymore. And we needed to carve out. The, the immediate future and become advocates for you as early educators. And I'll, I'll just say this has been the most rewarding uh, couple of a few weeks. It's been the most tumultuous. Um, and all of you have had very trying times and we've heard many of your stories. Um, but it's also been rewarding to see all of you band together and um, see, see how, how willing uh, you all are to contribute. I'd like to encourage each of you to join our Facebook group. This is where we've decided to bring you all together. Um, we make announcements here. We're trying to do two content, um, two webinars per week. Uh, and we've been, we've been fairly consistent there. Uh, and the, you guys just keep growing and growing. Here in our Facebook group is where we're gonna share with you real statistics. So. We take the number of child check-ins and check-outs. We, we try to report as accurately as we can on the number of you that have shut down completely. Uh, and then the other night, we had a really interesting uh, thread going on the PPP SBA loans and who's been funded and what banks are funding. And you know, it's been great to see each of you kind of say, hey, I got funded tonight or uh, we just got approval. So, so those things are great. Um, anyway, please join. Um, another thing we, we want to offer as stewards to the community, we have products that help you communicate with your families and with your staff. Uh, we, we've been hearing a lot, there's, there are these disconnections um, with, with uh, your staff because you guys aren't in the same buildings anymore, but please, um, please reach out to us if there is a place uh, where we can help you uh, and give you our product for, for now. Um, we'd love to do that. Um, so uh, we've got exciting content today. And in fact, can Genevieve, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Awesome. I want to direct everybody to um, Mr. Andrew Rozak's um, podcast. Uh, this is something as I was doing a little research on Andrew and trying to get up to speed for this intro, I listened to this 27 minute podcast and I could be off a few minutes and I couldn't believe the amount of content. This was recorded on August 14th, 2019. So, so, you know, seven, eight months ago. And, um, 
I could not believe how how valid all the talking points were. I mean, they, they were talking about social distancing at, at this time. Um, they were talking about business continuity, the supply chain, all the things that have come to fruition since this podcast. And this was probably four months ahead of what we, when we started hearing about uh, COVID-19 in China and Wuhan. Um, so really good stuff. I think it's great to go back and orient um, especially as we all try to orient around what media is giving us, around uh, what the partisan, what some of the political views, and as we parse through those, go back and listen to a, a real infectious disease expert and, and somebody that's uh, like Lisa Kunin that's put in you know, a 30 year career at the CDC. Um, so great stuff. So Andrew, um, let, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, everybody here attending will um, get continuing education certificates. We will send those to you tomorrow via email. You don't have to uh, write into us to ask about them. You will get them. If you're registered and you're on the, the call, you will get those. If you have any questions, please put those into the Q&A. Uh, click the Q&A Q button here and uh, Andrew will get to those. Andrew, if you need help with those, um, Genevieve and I will feed those to you in prompt, but let us know your comfort level. Your microphone and cameras, they're off. Um, it, mine's on. I have to keep all my clothes on for sure through, throughout, but yours are off. We will be recording this session and we will distribute this later. Andrew, real quick, before I get into your intro, will you be sharing your slides with us? Yeah, we're planning to send out a PDF of the slides and, and some other information to everybody. So you'll receive that as well. Fantastic. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andrew. He serves as the Executive Director for the Institute for Childhood Preparedness. He's the Chief Preparedness Officer, uh, Health and Environment for Region 2 Head Start Association and Adjunct Professor in the School of Community and Environmental Health at Old Dominion University. He has worked in emergency preparedness issues at the local, regional, state, and federal level over the past 20 years. He, is formally, he was formerly the Senior Director of Emergency Preparedness at Child Care Aware of, of America, Senior Public Health Advisor for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Emergency Care Coordination Center, and Senior uh, Director of Environmental Health, Pandemic Preparedness, and Catastrophic Response at the National Association of County and City Health Officials, where he worked with the CDC and the 3,100 local health departments in the United States each day to prepare communities for pandemics and disasters. Andrew, without further ado, uh, um, I'm looking forward to this and thank you for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. And it's great to see so many folks joining us today. Hope everybody's staying safe and being healthy. We're uh, all in this together. So we're going to talk a little bit here. Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, Scott, I think you have to stop sharing for me to, there we go. And I will share this here. We've got a, a few slides just to talk through, but uh, it's nice to be here with everybody. So I am the executive director at the Institute for Childhood Preparedness. Uh, as Scott said, I've got a long history of working on preparedness issues, emergency response, and, and pandemics. Uh, also, I've got a whole bunch of great books out there. If you're looking for something to read while you're cooped up, I would encourage you to grab one of these. Uh, the Preschool Preparedness for an Active Shooter book is available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And Preschool Preparedness for Natural Disasters, which includes pandemics, actually got submitted earlier this year. It'll be out this fall. I did not plan that. And then uh, recovery after a natural disaster is coming out next year. So a whole bunch of, of good resources there. So our job every day is to help early childhood professionals prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies and disasters. Our main bread and butter is going out and working with you in your programs in the community. And it's been very, very weird not to be in child care or Head Start programs for the last several weeks. Uh, because that's normally where we spend our time. Uh, we have a staff of 15 people that travel the country. Uh, we provide training in English and in Spanish. And, and that's, uh, again, what, what we do full-time for a living. 
I would like to stop and to echo Scott's comments and, uh, you know, recognize everybody for all the great work that, that the early childhood sector has been doing. Uh, it's no secret to any of us that many of you are unsung heroes and the work that you do every single day is hardly appreciated. And I think, you know, now more than ever, people are starting to understand the importance of childcare. As we look at K through 12 schools that are shut down, as we look at Head Start programs uh, that are, you know, not providing classroom services, but we look at those bread and butter family child care providers and, and child care folks working at centers and after school programs that are really, really stepping up in this time of crisis to serve your communities. So uh, we're here for you. We're part of their community. We've been working in early childhood for six years. We know your issues and uh, we're here to help uh, with uh, anything that we possibly can. But thank you so much. You are making a huge difference. And our goal is to keep you as safe as possible. All right, so let's talk about a whole bunch of stuff relating to coronavirus, and, and we'll have some time to answer your questions at the end. So please, if you have those, uh, share them in the Q&A. I will say that we have information available in Spanish and in English on our website, childhoodpreparedness.org. Uh, we've got frequently asked questions. We've got a whole host of shareable infographics, and we also have online training. Uh, we've got about a, a two-hour course on coronavirus what it is, how it gets transmitted, what your child care program should be doing to prepare, thinking about reopening, uh, all that kind of good stuff is, is included in the online course as well. So what is coronavirus? Coronavirus or COVID-19, we hear that term thrown around a lot. The same thing, coronavirus is COVID-19. Uh, the CO stands for corona, the VI stands for virus, and the D stands for disease, and 19 is the year it was discovered, so 2019. What makes this one interesting is that it's a novel coronavirus. So that's one that we have not seen before. And that's one of the big concerns. And that's really why nobody has any kind of immunity from this particular virus, because it's never been in the human population before. There's a lot of speculation right now about where it came from. Uh, we don't have to get into that now. Uh, but just know that this is the first time it's been circulating among human and being spread via human to human transmission. The signs and symptoms are shortness of breath. That's a big one because this does attack your respiratory uh, drive, just like a, uh, um, an Ebola or something similar to that. Uh, fever and cough. Uh, but again, a lot of folks we're finding are not showing any signs or symptoms, which is making this a little bit more complicated than a normal uh, influenza or pandemic outbreak. 80% of folks that get COVID-19 or coronavirus have mild symptoms. So that is the good news. That's, that's very good news. So thinking about our considerations of coronavirus, and I'm going to be as honest as I can with you because I, I feel that you owe, uh, you're owed a sense of honesty here. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat stuff. You're all, we're all adults and we need to be, this, uh, be in this with eyes wide open. So despite what you're hearing, this pandemic is not going to go away anytime soon. This is going to be with us for the long haul. This is going to be with us at least until the end of this year. Life is not going to get back to a sense of normalcy until probably next year. And the reason I'm saying that is because in order to get life back to normal, we need to have some treatment for this disease. And we do not currently have a vaccine. We do not currently have a treatment. There's asymptomatic people, people who do not have signs and symptoms that are out there and rapidly spreading this virus to other people, which makes containing the virus very, very difficult. Uh, you know, most viruses, if you get sick, you got a fever, and then you become, you know, contagious, and that's how it's spread. Uh, this one with the new and emerging research that's out there, and we'll talk a little bit about it, uh, it seems like you're able to spread this virus before you even show signs or symptoms, which makes it, again, very, very challenging. Now, there's some debate, and we'll, we'll look at a few charts about this as well, but there's some debate that this may pull back a little bit in June and July, and then we may see a resurgence into the fall. Uh, that's an open question, but that is definitely within the realm of possibility. Experts are obviously learning more about the disease each day, but it is very conceivable that by the end of this, and I'm not talking about like the next couple of weeks, but by the end of it, 40 to 70% of the world's population will get coronavirus at some time. Again, that's not going to happen overnight, but if you think about, you know, till the end of this year, it is conceivable. So what we've been talking about a lot is what they call flattening the curve. Now, what does that mean? Flattening the curve is basically, if you think about Black Friday and everybody rushes into the store to try to get those great deals, you know the store gets really quickly over, overrun, right? It's overwhelmed. It can't handle the customers. Uh, it's just a big mess. What we wanted to do by flattening the curve is make sure that that kind of a scenario did not happen at our hospitals because our hospitals don't have a lot of capacity on a daily, 
on a day-to-day operation anyway. If you've been to the emergency room or the hospital over the last year, you know there's not like a lot of people sitting around idle. Hospitals largely are for-profit businesses, and they're not going to put beds in that they can't fill. So, you know, anything is really, uh, hospitals day-to-day are usually at capacity. So by flattening the curve, what we're really trying to do is avoid having everybody get coronavirus all at the same time. So if you look at the chart here in the black line would be if we did nothing. And you can see rapidly we get all sorts of people infected, all sorts of people that need to go to the hospital, all sorts of people that need intensive care, and we simply don't have that kind of uh, capability in this country or anywhere in the world for that matter. So by flattening the curve, there's still going to be a lot of people that get sick. In fact, there still might be the same number of people that get sick, but it's going to occur over a longer period of time. So I don't want you to, to think that, you know, just because we suddenly stop the stay at home order that we're not going to continue to see new coronavirus cases. We are definitely going to continue to see new coronavirus cases because again, there's no treatment, there's no vaccine, there's no way to prevent it. Uh, So that's what we're talking about when we say uh, stop and and flatten the curve. That's what we're really looking at. One of the things that makes coronavirus um, a really unique challenge is that it is very, very contagious. And again, we're learning more about this all the time. I mean, you've seen the recommendations change over the last several weeks, and I suspect you'll see them change in the future as well. Uh, Originally, we thought, you know, this was kind of like you have to have direct contact with somebody, right? You have to be sneezed on, you have to be coughed on. Uh, But the more and more we we study this, we can see that, no, this this could be contagious just by somebody talking. Uh, We do, you know, send out particles from our mouth, some droplets come out of our mouth just when we talk, and that could be very well what's spreading the disease. Also, we see surface transmission, and we'll talk about that too, but the virus can live on surfaces. So if you touch a contaminated surface, and now you touch your eyes, your your nose, your mouth, your your, uh, any kind of mucous membrane, now you can introduce that virus into your body. So what we think uh, about social distancing, you can see the effects of the slide here. This is what we call an R-naught value, and an R-naught value is the way that we determine how infectious or how contagious a particular disease is. And the R-naught right now uh, what we think, at least, for coronavirus is about two and a half. Uh, I've heard some, story, uh, some studies that say, oh, it might be closer to six, but essentially it means for every one person that's infected, you infect two and a half other people. Now, obviously, you can't infect half a person, but, you know, again, this is based on averages in, in mathematics. So you can see how much this just starts adding up uh, if people don't stay home, if people do keep interacting, and how, uh, how compounding this to the problem can be. So where are we at right now? Well, we're kind of where we see that purple, right? So we started seeing the trend. We started seeing the uptick. We started taking social distancing measures, started doing stay-at-home orders, started doing you know, social distancing. All of those are lagging indicators. The stuff that we did two or three weeks ago, we're just now able to start seeing the results of that. So you know what a lot of the folks in public health are worried about right now, we're, we're worried that people are going to say, oh, look, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't so bad. People overreacted. This is crazy. And we're going to see those restrictions start easing up, which then may lead to a whole nother resurgence and and a whole nother bad uh, peak here that we don't want to see. So for example, when we start thinking about looking ahead, and I told you some folks are are looking at a resurgence in the fall, or depending on if we lift the stay-at-home orders and the social distancing stuff too soon, a potential resurgence. There's a few different things we simply just don't know. Seasonal variance is one thing. If you look at the normal flu strain, which is the same type of a virus, it's an RNA-based virus like this one is, but we know that seasonal impacts do have a big uh, difference, right? So in Florida, the seasonal rate of flu goes down about 20 or 30% in the summer months. Uh, If you look at places like New York or Chicago, uh, it goes down, you know, 40, 50, sometimes even 60%. So we see that flu starting to die off in the summer. And then as the cold weather returns, the, the flu comes back. That's just a seasonal variance. We don't know yet if that's going to happen with coronavirus. And I would say a lot of the folks, when you look at some of the data from Australia, when you look at from Brazil, when you look at from Argentina, who, by the way, are all in the middle of summer right now, right? They're in the Southern Hemisphere. The data doesn't really look like this is going to have a lot of seasonal variance. Uh, So we may very well see cases continue even when the weather gets warmer. We also don't know, there's a big open question right now about immunity time. And if you're looking at some of the data coming out of Korea, it's a little troubling because there's about 140, 150 people that seemingly had coronavirus, quote unquote, got cured and got better, 
and now they've been infected again. We're not sure what's going on with that. That's something that they're looking at right now to figure out more. Is this like a chicken pox where once you've had it, it always lives inside you and it can reactivate? Or is this simply that you didn't have immunity and you caught it again? Uh, these are going to really be important issues to decide before we can really start thinking about any kind of uh, getting back to normal. Vaccines are always 12 months away. Uh, that you know, we, we start working on the flu vaccine for next year, the year before, because it takes a long time to make vaccines. And so um, that's going to be a big open question, too, about you know, if we see this peak, if we see a resurgence again, how that works. And then testing is going to be key. And, and I really don't know how you start to reopen things without testing. And, and in many cases, you may have to take a test a week or maybe even a test a day for some of those high-risk prof uh, professions. So a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, try not to listen to the talking heads that you know, don't know this stuff, uh, that are just on TV, just blah, 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 and all the time. Uh, because a lot of times they're just looking to get ratings and they're just looking to scare people or I, I don't know what they're doing. But you know, if you start to, to listen to people that have been in this line of work for a long time, all this stuff is, is pretty well mapped out. Uh, this has happened before uh, with other diseases. So you know, we have some idea of how this may play out. We just don't have the specifics because again, this is a novel virus that nobody's ever seen and has had very limited time to study right now. The other thing that's a little concerning is that this is an RNA-based virus. So it's in the same category as Ebola, as MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, as SARS, and even the seasonal flu. And as I mentioned before, one of the things about seasonal flu is, you know, it's always changing. We have to get a different flu shot each year because the, the strains change each year. And the same thing now with coronavirus, since it's an RNA-based virus, one of the things about RNA-based viruses, they love to mutate. So right now there's about eight different mutations of this virus going around the world. And you can see the different colors and where they think the different mutations are occurring. Uh, what does this mean? Again, we're not really all that sure. This could be one of the reasons that you're seeing a higher death rate in some places, or maybe not. We're, we're just not really sure. But this is definitely one of the things we have to keep in mind about the mutations, because the worst thing that could happen is if we get a vaccine, and all of a sudden we start getting the vaccine out there to people, but the virus is mutated, and now the vaccine's not effective. Uh, so very smart people are looking at this stuff. They're studying all the, the sequencing. Um, but this is definitely something that, that's a concern and, and on the radar of uh, public health officials. All right, transmission. Uh, I'm going to just say that people are not showing signs and symptoms that are still spreading this disease. And you can look at the Chinese data, you can look at Diamond Princess, uh, you can look at a lot of different data sources that are out there. Uh, but it is very apparent that people are spreading this without showing any signs or symptoms. And this just came out yesterday. So this is, uh, this is brand new research. It's just breaking. Uh, this is an article from CNN. But people might be most infectious with the novel coronavirus before they even show signs or symptoms. And that's a growing body of research we're seeing out of France. We're seeing out of Italy. We're seeing out of Spain. Uh, we're even seeing here in the United States. So that's a, a really big concern. If we can't identify people that are sick and people that have the coronavirus, it's really going to make ending the coronavirus difficult. So what do we know? We know that it lives on a variety of surfaces. It lives on copper for up to four hours. It lives on stainless steel for about 48 hours. It lives on plastic for up to 72 hours. It lives on cardboard for up to 24 hours and can remain active as, a, as in the air for up to three hours. So this stuff really is, you know, spreading out there. And, and interestingly, they had a, a study that CDC did about the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship where they actually went in and looked at all sorts of different surfaces, and they actually found the virus still living up to 17 days after everybody had been evacuated from the ship. So while those guidelines are, are good, again, I don't know. We're, we've got some cases now where the virus has been alive for 17 days. Uh, it's still there. So uh, that's a game changer as well. And the thing that everybody's kind of struggling with right now is we don't know how much is going to make somebody infected, how much is going to make somebody sick. So we talk about the viral load and the viral load, you know, goes down each day. Uh, so if, you know, think about, you know, the virus and all of a sudden it's 100% and then two days from now it's 50%, three days from now it's 10%. Uh, normally with most viruses, we can say, well, after about two days, there'll still be some virus left, but it's not enough to make you sick. 
we don't yet know what that magic number is for coronavirus. So it's very hard to project, um, you know, what that magic number is. We do know from prior RNA-based viruses like MERS and like SARS, uh, that the virus can live in the respiratory tract of a child for 22 days. And we know that it can live in stool, so, you know, poop of a child for over 30 days. And that's something that we need to keep in mind, you know, being childcare providers, because we're always getting coughed on and spit up and changing diapers and all that. So if this is anything like its, uh, its family with the uh, other RNA, RNA-based viruses, it is likely that coronavirus could follow that same pathway. Uh, another thing I thought was really interesting that just came out this way too, uh, this week too, is that they did a study of a hospital and they looked at the ICU and then they looked at areas where coronavirus patients just, they weren't, like in the pharmacy and other areas. And what they found is that those places that weren't even treating coronavirus patients were actually, had the disease. They had the, they were, con, you know, contaminated with the disease. And they started doing um, swabs of patient, of uh, medical workers' shoes. And they found that about half of the shoes uh, were positive. So what does that mean? That means somebody's talking, somebody's coughing, somebody's sneezing, the droplets go out and they're airborne, gravity takes hold, they pull those viruses down to the floor, then you come through and you walk, now it gets on the bottom of your shoes, and now you're tracking it all over the place. So that's important for us to note too when we think about early childhood. I know many programs prior to the coronavirus had policies where you couldn't wear shoes in infants' rooms, right? That makes a lot of sense. Infants are crawling all over the place. Um, but this is a reinforcement of that. You need to be thinking about, you know, your shoes, what's, what you're tracking in. Same thing with your home. If you're going out to the grocery store, leave those shoes outside. Uh, don't be bringing stuff in. You know, I was a, a certified hazmat technician. So I'm one of those goofy guys that wears those big hazmat suits and <laughs> deals with all these crazy chemicals that can kill you. And a lot of the stuff that we're thinking about in hazardous materials, now we're starting to apply to early childhood uh, and the coronavirus, because it's, this is really the invisible enemy that you can't see. So what does this really mean to us? It means it lingers in the air. So keeping people away from coughing and sneezing is still important. Uh, some new studies show that the virus can actually travel not six feet, but all the way up to 14 or 17 feet. Uh, so social distancing is important. It's not the, the end all be all. If you have an option just to stay away from people altogether, that's the best. Uh, we also need to think about the contamination of surfaces. So packages, mail, groceries, things that you're touching, like your shoes, other things, can definitely be a source of contamination. Uh, as, hard as, as hard as it is for me, right now when I get an Amazon package, I don't rush and open it right away. I leave it sit out in the garage for a couple of days. Hopefully that'll take care of the virus. And then I'm very careful about when I open it. I open it, I get the contents, I wash my hands, I do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm not going to purposely be introducing things into my house or into my childcare program that may be contaminated. Uh, so very important to remember there as well. And I will just say there's been a little confusion about the masks. So let me just address the masks real quick. If I wear a mask, and I do, uh, it's over there, I can't get it. But when I wear a mask, my mask protects you. My mask does not protect me. So I'm wearing a mask as a courtesy to you because what that mask is going to do, it's going to keep those droplets inside, right? It's going to prevent me from spreading my coughs, prevent me from spreading the droplets that come out when I talk, and it's going to, you know, make you safer. So just because I have a mask on doesn't mean I'm, I'm a superhero and that I can't catch the virus. The mask is not protecting me from anybody else in the store. The mask is a courtesy to my fellow human beings. Uh, by the same token, it, you know, if you have a mask on, that doesn't mean you can get close to people. We still need to keep that six foot distance. Uh, but I think there's been a lot of confusion about the masks. And by the way, the new recommendations for masks is that we should all be wearing them, even children above the age of two. So think about how that's going to play out uh, in childcare. It's, it's going to be very difficult, guys. One other thing I, I think is really important, there's a lot of great products out there if you can get them. Uh, hopefully you have some of this stuff laying around. If not, you can make some bleach solution that'll work just as well. But it's really important on any of these sprays or wipes that you follow the directions because they all vary pretty dramatically. Uh, so some, you know, like Lysol wipes or some Clorox wipes, you only have to keep the surface wet for about four or six minutes. This particular brand here, the HDX ones, you can see on the label, it says, allow surface to remain wet for 10 minutes, let air dry. 
So in order to actually kill these viruses, we need to make sure that we're following these labels. If you take this thing and you wipe down your changing table, and then you come behind it in a minute and take your paper towels and wipe it off, that's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. You got to leave it wet for the whole 10 minutes. So that may mean going back and at the five minute mark, reapplying with another wipe and making sure that that surface stays wet. Uh, children are just as likely to be uh, infected as adults. Uh, I think that's important. The thing that we're seeing with kids is that they are kind of silent spreaders. So they are getting the disease. Thankfully, when we think about most pandemics, we think about the bookends, the very old and the very young. Fortunately, with this uh, particular virus, we're not seeing a lot of impact on the very young kids. Yes, they are getting it, uh, but fortunately, we're not seeing them die in, in really any big numbers, and, and thank goodness for that. However, like I said, they definitely can get it, and there's been a lot of documented cases of them. Here's one, a seven-month-old baby in South Carolina. Here's a five-year-old girl in Howard County, Maryland. Here's a 10-month-old baby in Maryland. Uh, so people are definitely getting this. Um, the other thing I think to keep in mind is that the average age of a child care worker is 36.2 years of age. We are still getting this virus, even if you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. It's not just an old person disease. Uh, you can still get it. And I was just reading about uh, two members of the Detroit Police Department, really good guys in top physical shape in their 30s, and they both died as well. Uh, so please don't think this is just something that impacts the elderly. It, it can definitely kill and it has killed uh, younger folks as well. One thing that came out this week, uh, two days ago, was that uh, folks in France and Italy and in Spain were starting to notice, and this is really true among kids, uh, was that they had small little blisters, almost like chicken pox, uh, on their feet. And it turns out this was an indication that they had coronavirus. Now, they weren't really experiencing any signs or symptoms, but when you look at their feet, it almost looked like they had, again, like a chicken pox. So we don't know a lot. It's a very small sample size, 88 patients. Uh, but out of those 88 patients, 20% of them had skin rashes. So could this be an early sign? Could this be something in children? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Something to think about. And we'll, you know, we'll keep an eye on this as more data's, uh, data comes out. But uh, I thought that was kind of interesting as well. The other thing to note, I think, is that you know, we have 9,000 plus healthcare workers that are tested positive for coronavirus right now. That's a lot. And, you know, if you think about all the gloves and masks and, and PPE, personal protective equipment that they're wearing, they're still getting uh, infected and, and some are actually dying, unfortunately. So if a medical provider with all the personal protective equipment in the world is getting impacted, we got to think about us and, and our environment. We can definitely be impacted as well. We're not immune to this. So let's talk about the big question. Stay open or close. This is not a decision that we take lightly. I understand that many of you, this is your livelihood. Look, we do in-person training for a living. My livelihood has been impacted too. I totally get it as a small business owner. Uh, so right now we've got a whole bunch of states that have actually ordered child care programs to close. Uh, we've got some states that have taken a, a mixed approach. Some states that have basically said, look, you're on your own. You figure it out. So 50 states uh, through the 10th Amendment and the plenary powers granted to the states to uh, do the health and welfare of people in their borders. They have this right. That's why you're seeing such a disparate approach across the United States. Rhode Island, the governor issued a statement a couple weeks ago, says, I need to change when the situation changes. And right now, I just don't think it's safe for child care centers to stay open. So some folks are taking a different approach uh, and some folks are taking other approaches. But let's talk about this. As a lawyer, one of the things I'm always thinking about are the legal ramifications. So we've seen a whole host of lawsuits being filed across the country. Here's one from Walmart. And basically what happened is we had a Walmart employee that went to work, got sick of coronavirus and ended up dying. And of course, as you can imagine, a lawsuit was filed. And the lawsuit is basically a wrongful death suit saying that the, the company, Walmart in this case, failed to give information to provide their workers with gloves, other appropriate protections and enforce uh, social distancing to keep them safe. So that, that's a, a lawsuit. And if you're a business owner, this should be a consideration that you think about. If you look at the USA Today paper, if you look at celebrity cruises, if you look at some of the nursing homes, you can again see a whole bunch of different lawsuits being filed from people dying and from people getting sick. So we, we need to be thinking about these as we start thinking about our considerations for reopening. 
Talk with your insurance agent. See what your coverage looks like. Some states are actually having conversations to give immunity uh, to, to folks if they're going to operate in these emergency conditions, but not everywhere. So, you know, check into that and see what kind of protections that you have. The thing about a lawsuit is anybody can file a lawsuit. It doesn't mean you're going to win, but it may take three to five years for that to be battled out in court. And think about all the time and money and resources and the strain and stress that that's going to be, that you're going to be under, you know, fighting that lawsuit. So definitely something to think about. All right, so I'm always watching the, the rest of the world and seeing where they're going. Uh, places over in Europe are a couple of weeks ahead of us, so I think that's interesting to see what approaches that they're taking. Yesterday, Denmark announced that they're going to start reopening schools and child care programs. Not to be surprised, a lot of parents and a lot of teachers got outraged and said, this is not fair. I don't want you to be treating our kids like guinea pigs and being the first ones to get back to work and, and have them to be the first ones to reopen. I will tell you, the United States... This is probably going to be one of the things that they're going to really hardly look at is to reopen schools and make sure all child care programs and Head Starts are reopened is one of the first tiers, simply because parents need to have a place to put their kids so they can go back to work. So you'll probably see a lot of stuff like this in the coming weeks in the United States. Over in the United Kingdom, you see the same thing. You can look at some of the headlines here. <clears throat> And, the, you know, the biggest teacher union in the UK actually banded together and say, you know, we demand personal protective equipment if you want us to come back to work. So is that a, a logical, a reasonable demand? Yeah, I absolutely think that it is. Um, so again, you'll probably see some of this stuff start playing out in the United States as we start having discussions about who can reopen, when they can reopen, and who should go first. And I, I do really think schools and childcare are going to be one of those first tiers that they want to get back open. So here's a, an interesting article that came out uh, two days ago out of Sioux Falls. And basically, you know, some other considerations. So this one was operating. And as you can see here, they had to temporarily close after an employee tested positive. And I thought what was telling here was kind of the quote from the, uh, the owner. And she basically said, you know, we did all these precautions. We did uh, confining people to rooms, reducing the number of potential exposures, changing into facility wash clothes, making sure our hands were washed. I want to say I did everything in my power to protect these kids and the girls. I don't want to look back and say I could have done more. So even with all of that, even with all the precautions they put in place, uh, this one still had to close. Likewise, again, you can just go on Google and do a search and you can see time after time programs in the United States are being forced to close after people are testing positive, after children are testing positive, after staff are testing positive, and after parents are testing positive. So, you know, many of you that are serving essential frontline medical workers, uh, think about that. The likelihood of those parents getting affected uh, and maybe even infected uh, is probably pretty great. Uh, I've also heard a lot of child care pro programs, um, you know, saying that, look, we're just not comfortable. Yes, we're okay to help watch the kids, but after the shift, the mom, the dad, whoever is showing up in their nursing scrubs and they're coming to my program in nursing scrubs, and I just think that's an, an unacceptable risk. And I agree with them. Uh, you want to make sure that you're controlling that kind of behavior. I also want to just keep in mind, if you do choose to reopen, think about your business. Think about what that's going to mean for uh, possible future business and any kind of stigma. There's an article that came out today out of uh, the Whole Foods Market in Washington, D.C. It is continuing to stay open. Right now it has six confirmed cases. And anonymous workers in the store say that they actually have 16 workers that are positive and they're being kept on the job. Is that true? I don't know, but it made a headline here in a newspaper and I'm going to read that and now I'm going to probably have a little bit of a different opinion about Whole Foods, about whether or not I want to go there, about whether or not I want to go there even after the pandemic is over. So if you, know, if you do reopen, there's a lot of things that are out of your control. If you do have to be shut down, God forbid if you get somebody who gets infected or somebody who dies, I want you to think about the impact that could have on your program just from a marketing, from a, a trust uh, from a stigma standpoint, uh, because you don't want to be considered that dirty program and have everybody, you know, not want to go back to your program when this was over. Uh, so a lot of different considerations here, guys. The other big thing that I'm excited to see is that a lot of states now are starting to put in incentive payment programs uh, for frontline child care pro uh, providers who are providing essential services at this time. This needs to happen. Uh, I wrote an article back a month ago on our website 
uh, talking about why childcare needs to close and we need to reopen up under emergency guidelines and with essential personnel only. Uh, you can read some of the logic behind that and some of the things I proposed on our, our childhoodpreparedness.org website. Uh, but this is true. We are essential workers. We should be getting hazard pay. And by the way, we should make sure that we have access to proper protective equipment and the cleaning supplies that we need, both of which are very hard to get right now. Help may be on the way. Help may be on the way. So the CARES Act provided $3.3 billion uh, for child care programs. Now, this is not Head Start. This is, this is for child care. Head Start got $750 million. Um, $500 million is going to go to summer programs, and $250 million are going to go to uh, increasing operations for coronavirus. But this is the CCDBG funds. This is sent out by the states. And you can see the three big buckets that they can use this money for. Continue to uh, provide continued payments and assistance, even if you have decreased enrollment or closures. Provide child care assistance without regard to income to essential workers. And provide funding to child care providers who are not participating in the subsidy, but for folks who need the purposes of cleaning and sanitation and other activities necessary to maintain or resume the programs. Uh, this was just announced by ACF. I've got the link down there and this will be sent out you know, with uh, all the other slides. Uh, but you can actually see how much money your state is getting. And some states, I know Virginia, I think last night, uh, put out a little bit of guidance of what they're planning to spend the money on. So you may be able to get some of this money to help your program. Uh, I know that uh, payroll protection program has been a, a a big failure for many of us. Uh, we applied, we haven't heard, but I heard today all the money is out. Um, so I don't know, we're looking at different ways to keep childcare afloat during these very trying times. Uh, yesterday, Senator Warren uh, announced a plan to provide $50 billion for childcare, uh, which would provide hazard pay to those providing care of essential workers, help childcare providers keep paying their staff when they're closed, and to shore up the childcare system, including boosting wages for the future. So maybe there'll be some help out there, guys. I don't know. Your message is getting to the hill. Now more than ever, we need to stay together. We need to you know, continue to be unified and talk about why childcare is so important and what a huge economic driver childcare is for the overall economy. Returning to normalcy. When is this going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not this year, may not be this year, you guys. Until we can get testing, until we can get a vaccine, until we can start figuring out who's impacted and who's not, uh, it's going to be very difficult to return, uh, return to a sense of normalcy. Uh, things you need to be thinking about though is staffing. Do you have enough staff? Uh, are your staff predisposed to, to having bad outcomes? So are they older? Do they have pre-existing conditions, immunocompromised? Have they had cancer? Do they have diabetes? Are they obese? Uh, do they have... Uh, uh, HIV AIDS or other kind of immunocompromised? Do they have asthma? Uh, these are all kind of things that you should be thinking about uh, because we don't want to have somebody come back and then get sick and, and ultimately die. That's not going to be a good thing. Space is going to be a huge requirement. We have to increase the square footage. Uh, we're looking at the ratios and looking for social distancing. A lot of programs are not going to be able to do this. I've encouraged local governments to look at buildings that are currently shut right now, whether it be a gymnasium, a high school, a sporting stadium, a convention center, a library, places with big square footages so that we can actually get kids in and resume classes but keep our distance from the other uh, classrooms. What you really need to do is have uh, uh, you know, three or four kids that are with one adult and try to keep them together as much as you can without mixing with other children. We'll talk about that in a minute here. Now is also the time to be pinging your clients finding out what their needs are, finding out if they can go back to work, uh, finding out when you think they're going to go back to work. Uh, I know some programs are actually now reaching out to uh, families and saying, well, I know we're not open right now, but if you want to give us a down payment, a deposit, we'll hold your spot when we do get uh, back open. That's one thing to think about. And once you start getting, you know, your clients and figuring out how many kids you're going to have, then you can start thinking about your staffing considerations and what that's going to look like. Supplies is also very important. Again, making sure you have access to cleaning products, gloves, personal protective equipment. It's very hard to get right now. So, you, you know, thinking about where you would get that stuff, if you could get it, how much you're going to have to pay for it, uh, all very important things we need to think about before we start reopening. Behavioral health is going to be a huge, huge issue. Um, we're working on this. We've actually got an online course we're developing now. Thinking about how do we check in with each other as adults? How do we make sure that we're okay? How do we message this to kids when they start coming back? How do we provide support to parents, making sure that they're okay? Uh, but rest assured, everybody's going through trauma right now. 
Uh, there's absolutely no denying that. And then having policies and procedures in place in advance. And let's look at a couple of those. Um, you know, this is your standard <laughs> coronavirus slide that everybody should be aware of now. Washing our hands, staying home, uh, cleaning those frequently touched objects frequently, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And that includes if you're wearing a mask, the tendency is to start playing with your mask a lot. Uh, we want to avoid touching the mask as well. From a policy perspective, we want to think about the lowest number of kids that we can to still be financially viable. If there's an option for parents to keep kids at home, that's definitely the safest thing we can do right now, but I understand that's not gonna be for everybody. Limit the amount of individuals coming into your program. I was just talking about how shoes are bringing the coronavirus into your program and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is not the time to be having people bringing deliveries and bringing packages and doing all that stuff. In the same token, those programs that have traditionally allowed parents to drop the kid off and come into your front door and go all the way back to the classroom, I think those days are over. I think we're going to have to meet parents at the front door, take the kid from there, and then us walk the kid back to the classroom. Uh, again, so parents aren't coming in and out and, and potentially spreading the virus. Common items like, you know, pens, pencils, screens, touch screens, keyboards, if you're using it by multiple people, you've got to make sure you're touching those. Uh, I would also encourage you right now just to waive your modifications a little bit and just sign in kids on behalf of the parent. Uh, that way you're not spreading around a pen or a pencil that, you know, multiple different people are using and putting their mouth and everything gross. Uh, let's just modify those procedures as much as we can. Limit the group size and keep distance. We talked a little bit about that. Limit the number of toys that are in use. Uh, now is not the time to be playing dress up. Those are very hard clothes to, to clean. We want to use um, hard surfaces that we can easily clean and easily disconfect. If we can, we want to try to keep it one toy per child. And as soon as they're done playing with it, it goes into a bucket and then we, you know, we clean it and, and disinfect it. Spread kids out whenever you possibly can. So if you're in an infant room, spread those cribs out so they're not right on top of each other. If we're outside, Again, try to do games that are fun, that don't encourage touching or being close to each other. You know, you could go old school and take a couple cans of soup and tie a, a string between it at six feet and play the telephone game. Uh, that would probably blow a lot of kids' minds because they probably have never seen that. <laughs> They're probably used to playing with their iPads. Uh, also, in nap time, stagger kids so they're not, you know, uh, head to head to head. Instead, go head to feet to head. And that way, if somebody does, you know, cough or they're breathing, uh, it's a little bit less likely of transmission. Discontinue the use of sensory tables or water play tables or any other kind of soft surface that's very difficult to clean for right now. A lot of folks are saying that you should do a daily health check. I think that's an okay idea because certainly if somebody has symptoms, we want to make sure that they are uh, taken care of and, and, you know, kept away from others so we don't spread. But as we mentioned before, it's very difficult. There's a lot of folks out there that are not showing any signs and symptoms. So the utility of a daily health check, to be honest, you know, we don't know. We don't know what, what that's going to look like. Make sure you're washing hands often. When kids are dropped off to your program, wash hands. When they're done playing, wash hands. Before eating, wash hands. After eating, wash hands. Wash hands as much as you possibly can. <laughs> A uh, mask we talked a little bit about. Again, the recommendation is anybody over the age of two. There's also some guidance that CDC put out earlier uh, this month about wearing a covering or protective wear. And I thought this was kind of interesting. So basically their, their thought right now is if you're going to have to be handling any children, picking them up or feeding them or whatever, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have like an oversized, like a button down or something like that, that you could put on on top of your regular clothes Use that when you're holding the child or use that when you're in close contact with the child. And by the way, if it's got long sleeves, that's even better. Um, and then once the child is done, once you're done interacting with the child, you take that outerwear off, you put that aside, and then, you know, that's, that's considered contaminated. Uh, also, I would, you know, strongly, if, if you're able to have a different set of clothes that you can wear at work versus, you know, at home, uh, that's really important, I think, too. We don't need to be bringing any of this stuff potentially back home with us. So if your facility happens to have a shower or a changing room or something like that, I would keep those clothes uh, at work. I would consider those dirty. Uh, before I left to go home for the day, I'd make sure I scrubbed down real good, took off my clothes, put on a pair of flesh clothes, and put those dirty clothes into a plastic bag. And then either at the facility or as soon as you got home, I would wash those. Wash those on the warmest possible setting that you can. Avoid mixing them uh, with other clothes if, if you can as well. 
Uh, this, <laughs> this is interesting. This is a shot uh, from Costco, and you can see what they've done there. They've actually installed all this plexiglass in front of the uh, worker there. Worker's not wearing a mask for some reason, but you can see the lengths that some other places are going uh, to prevent the spread of coronavirus. And again, you're going to see more and more of this stuff as we go on. I was contacted by New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut uh, about two weeks ago to help them think through and help them write operational guidance for programs that are open right now that are providing essential services. And I developed a 28-page guidance document that really talks about all these issues. Uh, it was then peer-reviewed and vetted by child care providers and public health professionals across the country. It's free on our website. Again, it's 28 pages of guidance, way more than I could ever talk to you about right now. Uh, but I would encourage you to go to our website and grab that. Even if you're not open now, you can see some of the guidelines that we've recommended, and you can start thinking about how you may be able to incorporate those into your practices uh, when you do start to think about reopening. Also, we've got a whole host of coronavirus resources on our website, again, in English and in Spanish. Uh, we have online training that's available. Right now we have the, the two-hour course about everything you need to know about coronavirus. We also have behavioral and mental health issues related to coronavirus, domestic violence issues and awareness, cleaning, sanitizing, and decontamination of your program, and reopening your program after the coronavirus. Those are all courses that we are currently in development, and those will be coming out soon. So if those interest you, uh, please pop on over to our website, and you can find out more information on that. We also know many of you folks are, are stuck at home. Uh, if you want to go online and get some continuing education and get some training, we have a whole host of training resources. Uh, we're running the special $50 off uh, deal right now on our, our premium preparedness partner program. Uh, so if you can go onto our website, if that's interesting to you, just use the promo code kangaroo and you can grab $50 off. So with that, let me, uh, let me hit the pause button here and, and Scott, maybe we can look at some of these questions and see if we can get some answers here. Absolutely. All right, so, so can you see the QA too? Uh, let's see, here we go, all right. So how long do we stay closed if we're scared of spreading the illness or being sued if this isn't gonna go away for at least a year or more? Well, you know, that's a great question. I wish I had the magic answer and the magic eight ball. Uh, the question really is, is going to depend on the testing. Uh, right now, the only way to know if somebody's contagious or has a coronavirus is the testing. And as we've seen, unless you're in the hospital, unless you're a high-risk person, you're not really getting testing right now. So there has to be a lot more work done on testing uh, before we can really start identifying people that have the virus and do not have the virus. If you're not showing signs or symptoms, should you be tested? In a perfect world, yes, you should be tested. But again, right now, because of some of the laboratory limitations, just the throughput issues, it, it's sometimes even if you get tested, you've got to wait two weeks to get the results. Uh, so that's not really effective. I'm, I'm encouraged to see the saliva-based test that is getting approved. I'm encouraged to see the finger, sti uh, finger stick test that's getting approved. And I'm encouraged to see all of the different efforts of pharmacies. They're stepping up and saying, hey, we can help. We can be testing centers on this. We test for strep. We test for other things. Uh, let's see how we can play a role. I do think those of you that have nurses in your program, whether you're a Head Start program or a private program, or maybe you're in cahoots with a school, I think there's going to be a major role for our child care nursing staff to play in the testing as well when this comes, uh, comes along. Um, CDC released new guidelines. Yeah, we referenced some of those. I think they're okay. Um, my issue with, you know, CDC is they're not in the child care business. Uh, that's why I think there are a couple – their guidelines are good, but I do think the 28-page document that we put together with the advice of public health and child care experts goes into a lot more operational detail about, okay, there's the guidance, but now how do you operationalize it? How do you actually do this stuff? Uh, I think that's a, a lot more meaningful for some of the situations that we're talking about as well. What are my feelings about a staff member who has Lyme disease? Should they be concerned coming to work? You know, that's so interesting. I When I worked in the Senate, I worked for a uh, – a senator from New Hampshire for a, a while, and Lyme disease always came up because <laughs> it's a big deal in the Northeast. So Lyme disease, you know, it's definitely an underlying condition. There's a lot of medical debate about whether or not it goes away. Some folks say once you get it, you have it forever. Uh, some folks say once you get it, it goes away. Uh, but it definitely does compromise you. So I would, I would say they, would, they should consult with their medical professional and get their opinion. Um, 
Uh, I, I would punt that to a doctor. My personal feeling would be, I think Lyme disease would probably put you at a little higher risk, but I'm not a, a doctor, so I don't want to don't want to say that definitively, but definitely a concern and something that they should check with their medical provider to, to find out more on. For sure. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll second that. You know, my wife's taking a lot of calls right now. She, she manages diabetics and I'd say Lyme disease is one of those prevalent comorbidities where you would want to have some extra coverage with at least um, a healthcare professional weighing in. I mean, that person's obviously already immunocompromised. So yeah, I'd be very careful there. Uh, how soon after social distancing is over, can we start having physical contact with each other again? Well, again, I think that's largely going to depend on the testing and, and the antibodies. So we don't have a, a good test right now. There's a theory of thought that if you get it, you're going to have immunity. But like I said, with some of the data coming out of Korea, we're not sure if that's true. There's about 140, 150 people that have got coronavirus a second time, or it's been reactivated. So until we really have better answers to those questions, I, I can't really say with any degree of certainty. Um, I, I hope it's sooner than later, but you know, for, for the obvious uh, future, uh, it's gonna be like this. It's gonna be social distancing uh, for a while. I know the LA mayor was on talking yesterday, floating the very real possibility that you know, concerts and sporting events and all those kind of things may not happen until next year. And, and Scott, you're, you're right there in the heart of, uh, of that area. So I'm sure you saw that too. What about programs that have many high risk at risk workers? Should these programs open up and take the risk? Well, I think that's really a personal decision. Um, I would feel a lot better if, if you would review, again, your policies, your insurance, all that kind of stuff and make sure you had some solid information before you just started reopening. Cause I am worried about somebody getting sick or your program getting exposed. And now all of a sudden you have to close for two weeks and you lose all that income. It's not cheap to have, you know, these places get cleaned. Uh, so while you think you might be making some, some money in the short run, in all odds, it might cost you more money because of the damage to your reputation, the amount you've got to be closed, and then the cleaning supplies and the deep clean you have to do. So again, not a, not a real good answer there, but um, I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as I can with you about just the situation that we're in right now. Hey, Andrew, one of the questions I see is about a 60 plus member of a team also, as an attorney, I was hoping you could weigh in on, one, having discussions around comorbidities like Lyme disease, diabetes, uh, some of the more high-risk comorbidities, and then also age. I mean, in every model I've seen, 60-plus is such a vulnerable age. Um, from a legal perspective, can we have those conversations, and, and you know, how, how do we approach those? Yeah, that, you know, I've seen a lot of discussion on the legal boards about discrimination and about even just, you know, privacy, about disclosing medical uh, information and all that. And I, I don't have uh, a lot of good answers for you on that either, Scott. I mean, you know, in a normal situation, you can't discriminate against somebody because of their age, their sex, their, you know, religion, all these things. But in this case here, um, you know, it is potentially a problem if you have somebody who's 60, 70, 80 years old uh, that could potentially be exposed. They're in a much higher category for, for bad outcomes. So I think, you know, right now, as in every case, documentation is key. Document, you have the conversation, you know, you said that, hey, you're at a high risk, do you still want to work? If these people are insistent in continuing to work, I would make them get some kind of a, sign a waiver or get a letter from their healthcare provider or do something as the owner so that if something bad happens, at least you've got some evidence, some written documentation that, hey, I did warn you about this. This is a very fluid situation. As we said, we got 9,000 healthcare workers that do have proper protective equipment and they're still getting exposed. I can't control this virus. Uh, it's a really an unknown right now uh, that, you know, the more evidence, the more documents you could get that you inform this person and now they're making an informed decision, I think would do a lot of good in case something goes south and, and there ends up becoming, uh, you know, some liability or some lawsuits here. Um, as the weather gets warmer, what should child care providers keep in mind when taking children outside? So this is controversial, <laughs> but right now the guidance is really because the time that the virus lives on those surfaces, 
a lot of programs and a lot of states even have issued guidance saying that we should not be using playground equipment. Playground equipment can easily become contaminated. We know that kids can easily put fingers in their mouth and now they're touching the handrails, they're touching the slides, they're going down the slides, they're touching their mouths. So a lot of places right now, they're saying that you should close your playground. Now that's gonna be very difficult to do. And I understand as soon as you take the kids outside, they're gonna to wanna to run to that playground. Um, so that, that's definitely a consideration to have. I guess if you are gonna to try to use the playground, you're gonna to have to figure out a way to, to keep that wiped down. And it's not gonna be easy. Um, you know, so I, I don't know the solution to that other than places are saying don't use playground equipment because of fear of contamination. If you are gonna use it, think about how you're gonna decontaminate those surfaces it seems to be a very onerous burden to every time a kid goes down the slide, you're going to have to go behind them and decontaminate it and wipe it down. Uh, plus with the shortage of supplies and equipment out there, again, I don't know that that's going to be feasible. So think about games that you can do far apart. Think about, you know, if you go out into the grass and spread out uh, versus having, you know, the, again, those constant surfaces that everybody's touching like handrails, uh, bouncy balls, soccer balls, golf balls, tennis balls, any kind of balls really. Um, I think that might be one thing uh, that you can think about. Um, any ideas on how we can get a hold of cleaning supplies? Boy, if I, if I knew that answer, I'd be a millionaire, guys. I don't know. Um, I would say that you should have a conversation with your local public health department or your local emergency management agency and say, especially if you're caring for essential workers, just be honest and say, look, we're here to care for you. Firefighters, paramedics, folks in the pharmacy, frontline medical workers, uh, garbage collectors, every, anybody that's a frontline, you know, uh, grocery store workers, we're doing this as a community service, but we can't continue to do this unless we have the proper supplies. And I would call either your local emergency management or your local health department or both and see if there is something that they could do for you and maybe give you access to some of the limited supplies that they have. Uh, that might be one possible solution. But, uh, you know, looking on Amazon, looking at Walmart, looking at Costco, all these places, I mean, pretty much everybody's sold out of this stuff. What else do you see there, Scott? Anything else that's jumping out at you here? Well, one thing I, in, in your background and policy, I'd be curious to hear this. Um, you know, we, we've had a few of the, the questions around resources like you just mentioned. As we kind of round out a, a strategic approach and, you know, some, some tactical um, clarity, do you think there will be funding for things like doing decontamination of shoes as people walk in with fog misting? Um, and will there be will there be funding and, and greater access to the protective gear that you're talking about, and, and things like you know best practices with sterile field? Like, uh, do you do you think there's there's kind of a funding paradigm there, or is there something we need to be echoing uh, up to Capitol Hill for for more advocacy here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the question is great. And, uh, and I think, you know, we're starting to see some policy recognition with some of the slides I showed you of the 3.5 billion and the proposed, you know, uh, legislation by Senator, um, Senator Warren. So, you know, in theory, that 3.5 billion that's going out to states could be used to purchase and, and use cleaning and, and purchase cleaning supplies and get places ready to go and clean. Now, as you know, it sounds like a lot of money but we've got over 2.2 million childcare providers in the United States, 2.2 million and only you know, 3.5 billion. It's not a lot of money. And some of these programs are very big. So that money, much like the uh, payroll protection program, that money's probably going to go fast. And again, this is going to the state. The state is perfectly within their rights to, to not give all the money out you know, to childcare providers. I hope that states will give all the money out to people on the front lines doing the work. Uh, but, you know, many states are going to have to pay their staff and do admin fees and all that. So now is the time because the money just got uh, released essentially yesterday. Now is the time to be working with your child care resource and referral agencies. Now is the time to be contacting uh, your licensing folks at the state level, uh, whoever's the administrator of that child care development block grant fund is at your state, and trying to get some clarity, trying to get some information. Uh, again, kudos to states like Virginia, who've done a good job and actually put out some guidance. Um, hopefully more states will start doing that. But 
Uh, we need to be very vocal that this money was a, a appropriated by Congress for us. We need this money now more than ever to come and support us. Uh, and I, I think, you know, together we're a lot stronger than, than doing it, you know, as onesies and twosies. So use those, you know, association of uh, eight, the ACs that are out there, the associations of young children, uh, use your CCR and R's, uh, use any kind of uh, support networks that you may have. I know the, the National Association of Family Child Care has got a great network. Um, so try to use those existing relationships to, you know, amp up the language to make sure that we're not forgotten about and all this kind of stuff. Andrew, well, I think we have, we have 36 open questions and what we'll do is we will copy them now We'll try to get them posted in our Facebook group. Uh, we might be leaning on you for a, a couple of thoughtful answers on some, but, but more than anything, I think everybody here, we, we had um, nearly 600, or we had over 600 attendees pop in at one, one time or another. Um, such invaluable data and information. We thank you for all you do, and we really appreciate the content and the time that you've given us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. I hope this was useful and uh, I'm sorry we don't have more specific solid answers, but we'll get all, we'll get through this together and uh, please just stay safe out there. All right, thanks everybody. Again, we will send up, send a recap. Uh, you'll be getting an email within the next 24 hours. Uh, please let us know if there's anything we can help you with. Thank you to you all for, for taking the time um, and we'll see you next week. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Thanks Andrew. Thank you, sir.